There is some more breaking news out of the January 6th Select Committee that really gets at how often the panel is still screwing the wings on at 35,000 feet. One of the committee's two Republicans who is set to lead the testimony next Thursday night, Adam Kinzinger, tells the Wall Street Journal this, quote, the panel could decide to request a written interview with Mr. Pence. The committee could also discuss whether to issue a subpoena to the former vice president to try to compel him to testify, he said. The committee is also weighing whether it will ask Trump to testify, Kinzinger said. We're back with our panel. Um, Jackie, again, there is so much... Um, that the committee is still gunning for in terms of evidence and witness testimony, that it, it explains the very uncertain path ahead for public hearings. But this, this would be huge, um, Pence and or Trump. I think you're on mute, Jackie. Sorry about that. We're having some technical difficulties in the House gallery. That's okay. You want to start over? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I, I should point out that former aides uh, and current aides to the former vice president have told us repeatedly that Vice President Mike Pence is unwilling to appear publicly to this committee. Whether or not he might have changed his mind and wants to appear behind closed doors and provide videotape deposition it is, is maybe in the realm of possibilities, but he has told his aides that he believes that appearing publicly is beneath the office that he held. He also has a political future he's looking ahead to and has really tried to extricate himself from this committee, putting forth just his aides. We saw already heard from Greg Jacobs. Well, we saw a videotape deposition from Mark Short. Um, and, and the former president himself has also told our colleague Josh Dossie previously that he would be opening to answering questions. Uh, but it, it's also <laughs> unclear if that is actually something that he would be willing to follow up on. You know, there are still some outstanding people like Ginny Thomas who have talked a big game so that they would come forward and, and cooperate, but we still have yet to hear from them. But there's also the bucket of people who potentially might ask the former president to now waive executive privilege or whom he might decide to waive executive privilege for. Those are people like Steve Bannon. That still is also up in the air, whether we'll hear from him. But as it is very clear in this moment, there are still crucial people, people like this support staffer who worked for the former president, uh, who Donald Trump just tried calling, and people like Patrick Byrne, who was involved in trying to implement the scheme to seize voting machines and worked with Rudy Giuliani, Sidney Powell, and these fringe figures who the committee is still speaking with and getting information from. Ben, you and I both know and worked with Liz Cheney in uh, 2000 and 2004. Um, what do you think when you watch her just investigative chops? I mean, you see some of her questioning of Republicans in these depositions. But her turning into everything that she believes it means to be a Republican, reverence for the Constitution, reverence for the rule of law, and disgust, not just with the, the, the lies told by Donald Trump, but the violence that threatens our country today, right now, as we sit here, because of it. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, she uh, is, is acting according to her principles and according to her values. Uh, in a way that may damage her politically. And she seems to all the world uh, as if she is at peace with that decision to potentially lose a House seat because she's doing the right thing. And, you know, that's one of those lessons that we all teach our kids and our grandkids, uh, And uh, but not everybody follows it. So hats off to her. Tim, what do you make of the way that public opinion, at least among independent voters, has moved with this committee? It's in part their decisions in terms of how and what they present. There's some reporting today of when they when they added Cipollone to the hearing this week, they lost some of the story they were going to tell about Trump associates and their ties um, to extremists. But they are sticking not just to a script, but to a, a length of public testimony that they believe is digestible and that will not just, you know, sort of be here today, gone tomorrow. Yeah, I think the committee's done a really nice job of trying to reach people outside of the super engaged political bubble. Uh, you know, you see this kind of on social media. Obviously, I think the Cassidy moment really uh, broke through. 
Um, if you look at poll, I don't think judging the committee's work on polls, I, I, I don't describe to that, of course, but, but just the reality, the outgrowth of what they've done. Um, you know, you have seen some weakening of the former president. Uh, uh, at the Bulwark, we do focus groups of MAGA voters that, to, to try to understand and, and keep in touch with, like, what they're seeing and hearing. And, and we've seen some softening um, of their, again, they're not, they haven't gone, you know, full Tim Miller, anti-Trump or anything, but, um, you know, maybe more <laughs> moving from, hey, I'm for Trump to maybe it's time to move on from this guy, um, which is a noticeable shift. Uh, we'll see if that stays. We've seen that before from Republican voters, and they you know kind of move back into him when the when the media spotlight is off. You know whatever his latest controversy is. So we'll see. I just just one really quick point of privilege on the Mike Pence thing. I, thank goodness I'm glad to hear Adam Kinzinger call for that explicitly. It's something that I've been wanting the committee to do. To have a Republican member do it is important. And I just you know to the extent that Pence's staff is keeping him from testifying because they think it's beneath him or whatever, or that he has a political career going forward. I just think both of those things are totally wrong. I think it's beneath the vice president to not testify in front of a committee, you know, when he has material info about a, about a, a, a coup attempt by his former boss that was going to lead to his death. I think the notion that Mike Pence is going to, you know, win over MAGA voters um, is preposterous. Uh, the notion that he'd want to win over voters who would be mad at him because he would speak truth about a coup and, and about a, a riot that came to kill him, um, I, I think just uh, shows a deeply warped inside the Beltway brain. And, and so I, I, I would hope that, that I'm not hopeful that he'd reconsider, but I do think that he should reconsider. And I'm glad that Kinzinger was calling for it. I mean, Jackie, I just keep thinking of all of the ways that Pence unlocks the Republican accomplices in Congress. I mean, because because Pence had to open the door that let the fake slates come through. We know Ron Johnson was trying to hand in that information from some of the evidence the committee has already put forth on the floor of the Senate on, on the sex. I mean, Pence seems to me not, not only to advance the committee's pursuit of the truth, but to gravely imperil the Republican accomplices of Trump's coup plot. Absolutely, Nicole. And I think that what we've learned from these hearings is that even if, if we've known certain pieces of information and unhinged episodes that have happened, there's nothing more powerful than hearing that delivered and described firsthand from the people who were involved in that. Uh, in particular, one of the moments that still stands out to me most out of this, this entire series of hearings is listening to Mark Short's aides describe him deciding to stick everyone in the uh, car to go to Secret Service and get out of the Capitol into safety, and Mike Pence saying, I'm staying here. I'm not letting you guys take me anywhere. To hear that in his own words would be extraordinarily powerful. And at the end of the day, this committee's mandate is to sway public opinion, to tell a comprehensive explanatory story for the American public to better understand what happened that day. There is no better person to do that than Mike Pence, the person who was at the center of it all uh, and who was the target of it all, the target of every single pressure campaign that was going on, who was in all of those meetings uh, with John Eastman trying to convince him that there was some constitutional wiggle room for him to actually intervene and send the results back. Uh, to the states. And the person who Liz Cheney said at the end of the day was the person who called the military, called DHS secretary, uh, called the defense secretary, not Donald Trump. But uh, his aides, again, they were in the room for a lot of those things, too. They maintain that they can speak to those things as well, that they already have spoken to those things. Uh, and and I, I, you know, I, I hear what you're saying, Tim, but I, I think it's a, a little bit of wishful thinking at, at this point in time for Pence to think that he has some sort of political future without at least trying to sort of insulate himself to some extent uh, from uh just completely alienating all of Trump's supporters and, and the base.